Welcome to the Rex Sanders Show. Glad to have you with us today. If you are here for the first time, we ask of a couple things. Number one, don't forget to subscribe so you get to hear the next episodes that come up. And then number two, uh, we're not bashful. Uh, we're not ashamed to beg. In fact, I've got a caller on today, so I would claim that I'm a well-dressed beggar. And if you like what we're doing, we beg you to give us the best stars. It helps us with placement in the app distribution um, markets. Then if you are a returning um, listener, we're glad to have you with us. You know, there are over um, 2.4 million podcasts out there with over 120 million episodes. So there's a lot of content to listen to out there in the markets. So we're glad to have you. Uh, a quick showcase of uh, what we like to do is to welcome our friends in different marketplaces. And so today I'm gonna uh, recognize for the first time our listeners who are turning in from Boise, Idaho. So welcome those in Boise. You join a big family with us. The show is listened to in 32 countries, over 500 cities on six continents. So it's uh, exciting to have you listening along. And if we could figure out how to market to those pesky penguins, and then probably more important, help them re, um, recharge their cell phones, we'd probably have listeners on the seventh continent. All right, so glad to have you with us. I uh, always recommend that you do this as a member uh, listening along. Please stop by the show website. The reason for doing that is our guests come on, they're amazing people doing interesting things, but we don't have time to get to everything about them. So please stop by the show website, rexandershow.com, and look through the pages, um, read the bios. There's bios and links to their social media, their products, uh, what have you. So glad to have them on the website. Okay. And we're excited to announce and promote that uh, the Rex Andrews Show is now part of the Daily Good Network. The Daily Good Network is a network of shows that are all about good. Um, the Daily Good Network floods the internet with good stories, good people, good things. So, all right, let's get on with our uh, program today. So, very excited about uh, our guest here today. Um, really interesting guy. And when I booked him, there are some particular things that uh, made me say, you know what, I got to have this guy on the show. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, probably the most important role any man will play, he's a father, okay? A husband, uh, which is a good trait too, not just being a father. Um, he actually is um, a former dad sports coach. So much like me, he coached his kids up until they got to uh, high school. He is a roller coaster nut. And I, what I mean that in a good way, he is an officiato. He loves to travel around and um, check out roller coasters. He's working on a path to catch up most of the or if not all the major league baseball parks. And then he loves horror movies, not only just movies, but horror movies. He does love movies, but horror seems to be the genre, genre that uh, he spends some time in. And of course, most importantly, we're gonna talk about today, he's an author. So I'd like to welcome to the show today, um, our exciting guest that we've been waiting to get on, uh, Stephen Patterson. Steve, how are you this morning? Thank you, Rex. Doing good. I'm excited to get started here. Yeah, it should be a good show today. So, uh, Stephen, what we like to do is uh, it's a, we're a, we are a mini biography um, program. We like to tell people stories. Success does not fall out of the sky. Now, where I live uh, a few months back, uh, we had airplane parts fall out of the sky about three, <laughs> three blocks from my house. But that's not how success works. It doesn't fall out of the sky. And I know you've been on quite the journey to write your book. So we'd like to talk about that. But first, what we'd like to do is to have you um, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Now, this is a long list of questions. Don't worry. You don't have to write them down. I'll fire them out to you. Okay. Uh, we, Sounds good. We'd like to know where you were born and then also where you were raised, which is often a different place. I had a guest on the show, uh, Ellie Soja who moved 63 times before she was the age of 15. So that has a big influence. We wanna know about your family. And so um, your, what your parents did when you were growing up 
you know, in their occupations and, and things like that. We want to know about your siblings, if you have them. And if you do have siblings, did any of them survive your, uh, your badgering and treatment as a kid? We also want to know about your um, interests as a kid. You know, did you play sports? Did you read computers? Shoplifting, and don't laugh at that one. We had a guest on the show, Larry Cole. By the time he was 15, um, has uh, had developed into a car thief. Uh, well, My goodness. <laughs> yeah. So we'll bop around on your um, history a little bit, some pivot points, and then you got to tell me about this book because it's based in some areas that I have a lot of inf um, familiarity with up in Nebraska. So uh, if you could, Stephen, take us back to the um, time. Uh, and place. Where were you born? I was born in a little town. It's called Arkansas City, Kansas. Okay. And um, a lot of people look at the name. It's spelled just like Arkansas, but people from Arkansas City, Kansas are very adamant that it's not Arkansas. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's right on the border of Kansas and Oklahoma. So um, I spend a lot of time in the Kansas, Oklahoma area. Okay, fantastic. Uh, growing up, um, what did you uh, do with your spare time when you weren't in school? Right. So I was in sports. I um, did everything from wrestling, baseball, um, football. Uh, by the time I got to uh, middle school, I focused fire all on football. I was a football player, a center for the team. Nice. Um, yeah. Very, okay. uh, yeah. Did really well. And then I actually had an injury in football where my bones on my heels pushing off as a center all the time, mm -hmm. the bones on my heels split apart. Oh my so goodness. it was like, basically I had two broken feet at the same time. So that ended my football career. Oh, that's too bad. Now, how big of a um, town was your hometown? So they say 16,000. I think it's more like, I think it shrank. I think it's about 12,000 people. Okay. So our big town was uh, an hour away, Wichita, which it's okay. only 60,000 people or so, I think. Sure. So it's not very big either, but that was our big town. That's where we went to malls and movies and stuff like that. We did have a single screen movie theater in my hometown. Well, if you think about Kansas, a town of six to 12 to 16,000, it's a decent sized town. I mean, my grandparents, my parents grew up in towns under 2,000 people. So uh, yeah, that's a decent sized town out in the farm, you know, in farm country. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we had McDonald's, so that's important. <laughs> okay. All right. See, you had, you had a little mark of civilization there, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, you were a football player. Love that. Um, how about siblings? Do you have siblings? I do. I have a sister and she is like constantly thinks that she's the wiser and uh, you know, smarter sibling, but you know, I, I let her know that that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> and she actually still lives in Kansas. So okay. she, she still does live back there and they have a, a fall festival that we used to always take our kids to. So we have a really good close relationship with my sister. Now I'm, I might get you in trouble here, but is your sister older or younger? Older, much okay. older. Okay. Yeah. Four years older. So <laughs> well, I'm just, I, I'm going to make, sure make a, that too. I'm a going to make a blanket sis, uh, statement because I am, my next sibling is an older sister uh, on that direction. And wh why would you expect any other thing, Stephen, that you would have an older sister that doesn't think she knows everything? <laughs> exactly. That's it. Right. Yeah. Just teasing, just teasing out there, my sister, if she ever listens. So. Um, that's fantastic. So how about your parents? What did they do uh, when you were growing up? So uh, my mom, she was uh, primarily a housewife, but she also worked in the school system. And she was, I uh, actually enjoyed being a lunch lady okay. in the school system. So, you know, a strong relationship with the kids and everything. And then later on, when she retired, she went back to the school system and became like a, a grandma for the class, you know, and helped teach the kids and everything. But she was primarily a housekeeper. Okay. And then uh, my dad, uh, he worked in the flour milling industry and he was a chemist in flour milling and he would test all the flour and make sure it was, you know, up to par, up to specs. And there's a big flour mill called Dixie Portland out there and he worked there. Okay. So your mom working in the lunchroom at the school, I just have to ask this because it's just my <laughs> weird warped sense of humor. 
you're probably a little older than when this happened, but remember the old stick that Adam uh, Sandler did with the lunchroom lady and he, he played that song? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah I don't, she, she was probably, that was probably before her time in the lunchroom, I would assume. We had, we had some perks with her being a lunchroom lady. It's like she'd bring home like when they had too many no-bake cookies or something. So oh, we nice. got no-bake cookies and items like that. So <laughs> there were some good perks to being a lunchroom lady. <laughs> Once you got out of high school, what did you focus on? Uh, when Did you go to school or military? Or? Now, I was, I really enjoyed my <laughs> social life in school, <laughs> so mm -hmm. to speak. I liked to party and I went to ASU. So that was a perfect place to party there. Oh, yeah. And uh, my kids always made, matter of fact, I was talking with some friends last night that I actually spent 12 years at Sorry. getting my four year degree at ASU. And I, I have a cousin that after eight years, his father finally cut him off. <laughs> no, no <laughs> doubt. So, uh, okay. I so, told my kids I could do that because there's only like $495 a semester when I started ASU. So yeah. it was like, <laughs> it was, it was my party school. So I finally got my act together and graduated. Okay. Fantastic. So question for you then, I want to skip back to one thing. Um, parental influence. Um, we generally find, well, I have found, <clears throat> this is my own categorization. There are three types of buckets for parental involvement. One is super supportive. They were pushing you all the way and they were fully engaged and you know, trying to get you to move on and do great things. That's the first bucket. The second bucket is sort of what I call the semi-non-participatory. You know, the parents love their kids, but they were so busy eking out an existence and a living that they weren't as engaged. Maybe they didn't push them into college and those things. And then the last one is not the good bucket. That's the bucket where uh, kids had some sort of abuse or traumatic experiences and those types of things. And it basically motivated him to say, hey, I don't want to be anything like that. So looking back at, at your childhood growing up, which of those buckets might you um, fall into with your parents? I was blessed. I was in bucket one. Okay. So quite the blessing. And my parents were very engaged uh, with me and my sister. Uh, as probably taught me a lot of things that I did in life, you know, with my kids in sports. Uh, my dad helped uh, coach my sports teams. Okay. And, you know, mom was always there. And I um, have a dedication in my book to mom. Uh, she recently passed away. And uh, I say something about she always took me to all the movies and bought me all the horror books and everything. <laughs> so she was, you know, very involved with me and my friends. My house was the house that everybody came over to to play Atari Back in the day, we, oh, we yeah. had a basement downstairs, so the kids went downstairs and we'd play Atari. So that's was, funny. My house was the hangout house. When I was in high school, I wanted an Atari so bad, but my parents, two things, didn't um, want me to have one and couldn't afford it, honestly, too. So I was pretty entrepreneur type guy, so I was always off doing it. So I bought my brother's a Atari <laughs> as a oh. As a Christmas gift, and guess who played it most of the time? So, uh, <laughs> that's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you uh, get the gifts you want to use if they're too small. <laughs> so, anyway. All right. So, uh, what all now you spent quite a bit of time at ASU down there in Tempe. Um, what did you finally uh, end up uh, studying? And then, you know, what was the next hop after that? Yeah. So, I went to school for engineering electrical engineering and um like about around 10 years i realized it wasn't for me <laughs> and so <laughs> it well, took me a while so i, I, went in I can i can see you were decisive right i mean you yeah, know after yeah. 10 years right <laughs> yeah so um it's funny because my younger son he's in mechanical engineering and so i'm like oh i i'm reliving some of the horrors when he comes home and tells me about his classes <laughs> but um yeah, I, so then I moved over to the School of Business and actually the Bachelor of Science in Economics nice. is what I started, studied, nice. so, yeah. Okay, so you in your bio, when I was looking at that to uh, set up and have you come on the show, um, I know you're an author, but you mentioned that it took you 25 years um, to write this book. Now, I'm going to tease you a little bit. 
<laughs> that may not be surprising that you took 12 years to get your degree. <laughs> so 25 years to write a book may not be out of line. It may not be a bad pattern, right? You're right. Hey, I, I accomplished both of them eventually. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a persistence thing, a marathon, you know. Yeah, You don't exactly. want to sprint and tire yourself out, right? I mean, you know, let's, let's go for the marathon. Uh, in, in jest, um, tell me a little bit about your book. Uh, so it is a suspense mystery, um, a little bit of horror, quite a bit of horror, really. <laughs> okay. But the suspense is the main thing. And it takes place, uh, much like me, uh, it take, takes place in the Midwest, in Nebraska primarily, but also Kansas. And then in the kind of it's split up into two time frames. And so the earlier periods are in the Midwest, and then the later periods are in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. And it's now, a mystery suspense. A mystery, mystery suspense. suspense. Yeah. Okay. Psycho killer type. Psycho thing, killer you know? type. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I had a guest on just a little bit ago. I uh, don't have my list in front of me. Very prol prolific writer who since 2017 has written 28 bit books. So now I'm going to give you crap here a little bit. <laughs> Maybe you're the least prolific writer <laughs> that it took you 25 years to get this finished. One really good one though. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We're talking qu uh, quant quality. quality over quantity. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, a marathon, uh, you know, a, something like that needs to be aged, right? I mean, it right, needs right. to be. Right. Yeah. So, so I actually, ahead. I had to, because um, I started writing it right out of college, I uh, began an internship and kind of on my spare time, I did uh, the writing. And uh, so I started writing it right out of college. So mm -hmm. it's, that's when life started going a little crazy, uh, you know, marriage, kids and everything. Yep. And so I kind of put it on hold. So I had to go back and the first two chapters that I'd written had to go back and change the dates and everything because they were so long ago. In the right, past. right. Now, did you self-publish? Did you hybrid? Did you go through a publisher? How'd that work out? I self-published. Um, okay. Yeah, a lot of learning there. Um, people ask me, well, how, how'd you do, you know, uh, how'd you publish it? How did you uh, do your cover and everything? A lot of YouTube videos. And then I'd watch the YouTube videos and still be so frustrated trying to get the cover just right. Sure. Uploading it on Am sure. can I say Amazon. <laughs> yeah. So, so your book's available on Amazon. So please give us the title. Yeah. Not Normal not by normal. Stephen Patterson. By yeah. Stephen Patterson. Easy one to remember. Not All normal. right. So not going to give away your 25-year gem story. Um, what's the high level precedence of the book? You know, you told me it's a, it's a, a mystery. Okay. Um, what's the high level of the story? So, uh, Patricia, she lives in Gilbert, Arizona, and, uh, she wakes up one day to see yellow police tape across her cul-de-sac mm -hmm. and a couple of detectives investigating a murder and they come to find out it's a pretty grisly murder, mm. uh, very violent. And uh, they had just recently had a previous very violent murder. And so they realize after that, they're um, actually dealing with a serial killer. Okay. And so the serial killer is going to the suburbs of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And as I said, there's a time frame where we explore what he was like growing up as a child uh -huh. in the Midwest. And so it focuses on how this serial killer becomes who he is in present time and his thoughts and his, you know, lack of emotions and his family life. Oh, fantastic. So that's a lot like my show, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it is. Well, you should, you should interview the killer. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe I can either get the killer on or I hope and pray nobody I've uh, interviewed is the killer. Cause we tell yeah. the story. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's a, a lot of people in the book. A lot of the characters in the book I take, uh, people I know and take little bits and pieces of them yeah. and they're not like exactly like them but there's a lot of parts to them in certain characters and so people always ask me well who who did you base the, the killer on the most and I said well I guess if anyone me <laughs> so <laughs> now but. wait a minute wait a minute Stephen I didn't maybe I should be calling the authorities I don't yeah. know if I should be uh, getting a confession yeah. from a killer here today yeah trust me no nope, that's not the case but a lot okay. of his, his characteristics maybe Fantastic. So what's the biggest thing you learned on writing the book? 
I guess never give up. It's, um, I uh, started, like I said, as an intern, um, always had in the back of my mind, uh, my eighth grade English teacher uh, from Kansas in my 1981 yearbook uh, wrote, send me a copy of your first novel. Mm. And so when I finished it, that was one of the first things I did. I, you know, I'm a big, I like to go on Facebook with all my friends and everything. I had to take a picture of the book and the post office together and say, okay, now it's up to the post office. Right. And so after, from 1981 to 2021, I mailed her a book and a week later, I got a two page letter in the mail from her and she was all excited, gave me her number. So we text back and forth. And then, uh, matter of fact, just like the other day, I got another letter that she finished it. So, <laughs> so she read the whole thing. And so I, I, as her request in my middle school yearbook, I sent her a copy of my first novel. So when did you get it up online then? Uh, April. April. So, yeah, it's, it's only been up online since April. Well, I'd already, I, I would normally ask somebody how long it took to write them, but that's, we're not going to go there because we know you <laughs> took it down there. <laughs> Um, did you have a little extra, we don't, extra time during the pandemic to finish this up? Yeah, so I was a very corporate uh, employee. I worked for Corporate America uh, 20 years. Um, now, I did have a series of unfortunate events happen. Um, in 2019, my mother passed away. I talked mm -hmm. about her earlier. You know, very important part of my life, my sister's life. And she passed away. So the book is dedicated to her. And okay. so that, that, that was a very difficult time. But then also I came back to Arizona after she passed away and uh, I got laid off from my corporate American job. Ah. <laughs> I, yeah, so I had been with the company for 20 years and one day on the day I got laid off. And on the Friday before, I, they had my uh, you know party in the break room with cake and plaque and all that good stuff. <laughs> and then Tuesday I got laid off. Wow. So I had extra time for the pandemic and also extra time from being laid off. Fantastic. So uh, what, looking back on your journey, um, were there things that you do different now? I mean, looking yeah. back, anything that you would have done differently? You no, know, I look, I always think about stuff like that. And, you know, I have a, I have a pretty wonderful life overall. It's like my children are, you know, everything to me. Sure. And I'm very, very proud of my boys. And you always think, okay, you know, actually in the book, it talks a little bit about the sliding door theory, you know, the, mm -hmm. take this door, that door, you know, door shuts, door opens, and how much that can change your life. And one of the characters that changes his life quite drastically. Right. And um, so I think about that. I'm, I'm a big believer, you know, it's just a little, little bit of change. And, you know, maybe I want to have two wonderful children, you know. You never know what can happen. So I don't think you can really look back and say, okay, I wish I, this was different. Okay. So uh, you coached your boys in baseball, right? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, T-ball all the way up to high school. Ah, uh, T-ball. Oh, I remember those days. <laughs> I used to bribe the older one. I, he wouldn't want to stay in the field. And I was like, oh, there's a playground over there. Yeah. <laughs> when you're done, you can, go, you can go play on the playground. I'm sure there's a developmental reason for T-ball. Uh, I know I'm going to get to watch some more because I uh, became a grandson, I'm a grandfather about uh, a little over a year ago, and my son-in-law is a huge, a huge baseball guy. So I know I get to go to some t-ball games. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you said the coaches would run around the bases with the kids just so that they can uh, know which way to go. See, my sons were stellar athletes, and they they played primarily football, and. Uh, boy they would just knock the ball out of the park then they'd be mad because they could only take one base and so uh you know that was the thing that they didn't like about t-ball well do you have any more books on the horizon so this one's called not normal as i said now i was actually um starting the sequel paranormal Mm -hmm. and I've gotten a little bit into it, not too much, um, and it's going to be, just like the title says, it's going to be a lot more of the supernatural type, where this is more grand, grounded in reality, not normal. Paranormal is going to be a little bit of a more of the supernatural type, and then the killer in not normal is uh, really into his body and really into exercise and everything, 
And so I always joke that the third one will have to be abnormal, will be Anthony's workout book. <laughs> All right. So looking on the fact that you have a gray hair or two, I'm hoping that you're not going to take 25 years to write the next two, are you? Yeah, maybe from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Finish it up. That'd be one hell of an interview about that book. That's for sure. Yeah, really? No, I actually originally was going to put the in kind of the beginning of paranormal at the end of not normal. Like mm -hmm. I said, I'm a big movie fan and well, Quentin Tarantino is one of my favorite directors. Oh, he does and, great stuff. <laughs> yeah so i watched kill bill over and over again and i was oh, watching yeah. it into kill bill and you know they they bring the gal down in the interviewer so it's basically and he says do you know does he she know and so they kind of start kill bill volume two uh you know at the end of kill bill volume one and so that kind of inspired me i was like oh maybe i should put the beginning of paranormal at the end of not normal but then i decided against it so i get just a little bit into it well from his movies i just absolutely love the Hateful Eight. That's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> I do too. I, Bob. <laughs> yeah. Bob. Yeah, I do too. I, I you know. I think my favorite is Reservoir Dogs. I still big yeah. Reservoir Dogs fan. Reservoir Dogs. And of course, then there's just the the whole weirdness of Pulp Fiction, you know, and stuff. But and uh, once again, one of my inspirations, the timeline in Pulp Fiction really inspires Not Normal. Um, going back and forth, present to past, yeah. and it comes together a lot like Pulp Fiction, where it all comes together. So yeah. that's actually one of my inspirations. Well, that's that's cool. No, I've always been uh, a Quentin fan just because his music, his movies are very abstract. And then the other ones that I've always loved is the Coen Brothers. I mean, they <laughs> can you see over my shoulder here? Yeah, I can. <laughs> Sucker Proxy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's one of the ones a lot of people don't like of the Coen Brothers as much, but I I still like it. I'm raising Arizona. Miller's Crossing. Oh. That's Miller's Crossing is my favorite, probably theirs. Think about it, hi. <laughs> exactly. I literally I have buddies and I who could quote can quote most of raising Arizona. You know, we, me and my buddy, it's like because we we <laughs> like it so much, we'll start doing the music that doo doo. Doo -doo, after a couple of drinks, yeah. <laughs> we drive my wife crazy with the doo -doo, doo -doo. <laughs> you never leave a man behind. I mean, just there's never so many. Anything. Yeah, I've never heard anything so stupid as a man chasing after his own hat. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that's just a crazy movie, you know. So, uh, no, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's funny, and, and so you have a sort of eclectic, funny uh, perspective the, or sense of humor. The thing about raising Arizona too is filmed all in Tempe, Arizona, and Scottsdale, yeah. Arizona, and yeah. so it's like it's kind of fun to look at the landmarks there. It's like um, I'm kind of a landmark guy, and so my father, I mentioned, he was a flour miller. Mm -hmm. uh, he, when the reason I lived in Arizona, I moved out here my uh, sophomore year, was he got transferred to the mill on mill. Okay. And yeah, so it's a big landmark for those who aren't familiar with Tempe, Arizona, but right on the river bottom, there's a white yep. mill. And so it's the main street in Tempe is called Mill because of that. And yep. so and one of the scenes in my book actually takes place the Mill on Mill. Wow, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, um, Raising Arizona and The Hateful Eight, uh, those are just, uh, you know, from those two different producers. But wow, I just love those movies. Yeah, so yeah, fantastic. Um, older older movies. I like Sergio Leone. I like the old westerns and stuff. Spaghetti westerns. Yes, yeah, the spaghetti westerns were great. You know, I tried to watch some of those recently on uh, Netflix, and you know they're pretty choppy and from as far as the production quality and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. It's not like what we see today. You know, Clint Eastwood polished always, like it is now. They're not polished well, at all. And then, of course, Quinn takes a lot of his inspiration from Sergio Leone, too, and yeah. uh, the Spaghetti Westerns. Yep, The Good, Bad, and Ugly, one of my other favorites growing up and stuff. Great movie. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. I yeah. love Henry Fonda as a bad guy. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. It's been uh, good to hear your story. Um, again, your book is on Amazon, right? It is. Not okay. Normal by Not Stephen Normal Patterson. By yeah. Stephen Patterson. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, Traditional spelling of Patterson, right? Yeah. P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. 
Fantastic. Well, I have one last question for you, Stephen, that I ask everybody, and that is a very simple question of, um, you know, we have this concept in the Western world of a bucket list. Okay, so things we want to do before we leave the world. But as you know, of being someone who had a science background and you know, economics, there is a opposite of everything in the world. So there's another list out there that is things we don't want to do or don't want to do again. Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show, so I won't say that word, okay? But it's the list of things we don't want to do, so the F it list. So I'm going to ask you to see, and I'll give you a minute here to think or two, um, to uh, give me a, an item or two that might be on your F it list, okay? You've shared a lot of your history and those types of things, but this is a telling question. So I'll give you a couple examples for me. Uh, I'm not going to have a collection of pet snakes or a collection of pet rats to feed to the snakes. I have no interest in any of those. I'm not eating cav caviar or sardines. Nope, sorry. And I will never, ever again, and I did an episode on this, uh, do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge, the concept of excessive heat, excessive humidity, excessive drumming, excessive chanting, and a slice of nudity. I just have to. <laughs> that. So what might be an item or two that's on Steve's effort list? Well, I definitely don't like snakes either. So I'm on the same boat with you on that. But um, I would say, uh, like on a more serious note, uh, my job that I was referring to for 20 years, probably about the last two years was really, you know, it just wasn't enjoyable. Yeah. And so I should have got out of it. It was kind of a blessing in some ways and I got laid off and was able to write my book. Yeah. So I was in a job that I really wasn't enjoying and stayed in it and made my life miserable. Yeah. And so that um, I, I, I'll never do that again. <laughs> so that's that's the big one. Oh. But yeah, I um, uh, always want to be around people. So being alone, I'd never want to be alone. I'm okay. a very social guy. So, uh, you know, more serious things, but definitely. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Important to me. Yeah. Well, any guy that doesn't want to have a collection of pet snakes is all right in my book. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a cat guy either. I offend the cat people out there. I'm a dog guy, so I probably might want cats either. I want to hang out with the cats. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you for coming on, Stephen. I appreciate uh, your time this morning to tell your story. Good luck on the book, and then we'll be looking for you on the next round. So do reach out when you get the next one done, and I hope it's not in 25 years because yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be uh, doing this in 25 years. You never know. <laughs> never say never. So yeah, really, okay. Well, thank you, Rex. No, I really enjoyed myself. Yeah. It's, it's always fun to have people on the show and learn their stories. Okay, folks, until next time, we'll call that a wrap for this episode. Uh, please don't forget to stop by the show website, uh, take a look at um, uh, Stephen's um, biography and, and information there links. Um, please check out his book on amazon.com. So go to the show website, rexandrewshow.com. And we're always happy to announce and express that we are now part of the Daily Good Network. And the Daily Good Network is a network, um, a network that is dedicated to good daily things. So good shows, good people, good stories. So until next time, uh, I'll say the things that I always say that have been somewhat influenced by the pandemic. Be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.